Where's the channel phone? Okay, let's see. So that's working. We've got some people on. Can everyone hear me fine? I'm using a new setup today, which has the... Sorry, I can't talk and do multiple things at once. Um, pop out chat. There we go. I'm trying a new setup today. I got my new laptop, thank goodness, and then also finally got around to finding my old microphone for YouTube and got some chroma key lighting up so you can actually see me, which is fun. Uh, so we'll wait just a couple more minutes before we actually get started on the lecture itself. Uh, for those that are already here, um, I posted in the inspiration tab let's see if I can find it I posted a video a TED talk that I would love you all um, or no inspiration uh, that I would love you all to go see as some of you already have and probably some of you haven't forgot to market uh, which is fine um, I just like when people market so I can kinda get an idea of the engagement of the class uh, but the TED talk is on the astounding p athletic power of quadricep uh, quadriceptors or more so just kind of like the algorithms that uh, these machines can use and utilize to be really really to to do really really cool things and interact with humans on a level that's just not been been able to be done before with any sort of human machine before now um, it's really really cool uh, there will be, I believe, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow at 8 a.m., uh, the next TED Talk, the, just for inspiration, which is really, really cool. Uh, so please do check that out. I will check the stream one more time, and then I think we'll get started. So again, can everyone hear me, see everything fine? I will hope. 
We'll get started at 2.05. I posted the link a little bit late, so let's just wait for some people to hop on. Okay, so one more minute and we will get started here. Uh, if there's anyone that should hop on the stream, go ahead, let them know, and we will get started. Okay, so today uh, we're gonna, one quick change I wanna cover. So uh, one of the students referred me to something called REPL.IT, which I absolutely love. So. Uh, we're going to open up a new window here. Go to REPL.IT. If you um, haven't seen this, haven't used it, go here. And then sign up. You can log in with your Google account. So if you're already logged in for the, the Google Classroom, you can go ahead. Just use that to log in. Um, it uses your Google, your Google login. And then you would hit a new one like I did just a moment ago. Select the C language, not C Sharp, not C++, because those are... Uh, different languages, but C, and then it'll start here. And I love this uh, this site and this uh, this software because the input mode works so much better. Uh, GCC the compiler seems to work a little bit more smoothly, and I just like the editor better. And so I feel like that will really help uh, this everyone to to be able to accomplish the assignments a little bit more easily and see what's going on and also just because jdoodle did have some issues uh, with the input output uh, so i want to make sure everyone is able to not have issues with their with with the platform and instead find issues that they have with their code so we can learn so um so from now on everything will be uh, submitted using a share link from this site uh, just because like i said it's so much better than jdoodle so uh, we are past 205. Thank you for uh, tuning in, whether it's real time or later on. And if there's any issues with the stream, I'll check the, like I said, I'm using an encoder for the first time. Uh, so it's a little bit more technical. Uh, but just, just let me know how it's going. And if there's any problems, I'll check the live chat and hopefully we can get those resolved. So anyhow, uh, the lab one solution I want to go over real quick. So let me pull up, I'll do a quick split screen. Where's the labs? So I apologize for the confusion on this lab. I should have specified earlier on that it is in fact, page five is all you have to worry about. Page six, you don't have to worry about anything before page five. You don't have to worry about all that, just page five, um, which here, you don't even have to worry about all of this. All you have to worry about is just literally the problem and then example executions. Uh, it gives you a few. Uh, it gives you a few equations, so you don't have to find anything online. It's pretty simple, and I will go through the entire solution right now because it should take just a few minutes to code. So, problem: given a planet that orbits a single star is expected to experience an eclipse, eclipse that will last 60 minutes as viewed from its capital city. Engineers in the city estimate that the percentage of the star obscured by the natural satellite of the planet is determined by P equals minus 0.11 times T times then T minus 60. Furthermore, the brightness is a linear function of the percentage of visibility as B equals 7.99 times V plus 1 26.7. 
Given the minute of observation when the eclipse is occurring, determine the percentage that the star uh, that is obscured and the expected brightness as observed from the capital city. So let's drag this out right here. We'll throw this on the left side still and then drag this over and we'll just scale it. We don't need the compiler for the moment. So the first thing we see here that we're going to need input and output. So for that, we need to then first include the header file for the standard input output. Standard IO, stdio .h, include that. We need a main function, so int main. There's parameters, but there's no parameters for main. Uh, so we're going to put then on the next line our curly brackets. Every main function should always uh, return zero because that means that it's successfully executed. So we're going to put return zero. And now we're able to start doing our function declarations. Now, function declarations should always be kept separate from your executable statements. Function declarations would be like uh, variable declarations, uh, variable declarations, I can't really think of anything else at the moment, um, but your executable statements then will be, it would be pretty much exclusively um, variable declarations. But then the executable statements would be things like function calls, uh, math, etc. So it doesn't look quite yet like we're going to need any math, so we don't have to worry about including any other libraries. Function declaration. So you can see here that, let me zoom in a little, we can see here that we're going to need something for the percentage of the star obscured. So we can go ahead and make a, a, a variable for the percentage of the, the star obscured, uh, which we see here that there's a decimal percentage to this, or a decimal portion. So that means we need some sort of a floating type variable type. So we're going to use double or double precision, and we're going to do uh, percent star obscured. So we've now declared that variable. It also says here, the brightness is a linear function of the percentage of the visibility as B or brightness equals 7.99 times V plus 126.7. So the brightness of the uh, so the brightness of the star. Then, um, if we go back and refer refer to this, which admittedly I am solving this real time, but that should give you a better idea, kind of of the the problem solving, I guess, process for these labs. So let's see. Um, we know here we have to enter in the minute of observation, which would be t. So we also then need since that's going to be a whole number, we need an integer time declared then an integer or a whole number variable called time. Uh, the brightness is a linear function of the percentage. Current or percentage obscured is 55 at time 10. Current brightness at time 10 is expected to be this. So brightness equals times visibility. The visibility is the percentage visible. So we have percent star obscured time and now we need brightness. We see here that brightness is going to be a floating point data type as well so we're going to make that double precision or double data type uh, visibility or no no brightness excuse me brightness star or of star. <clears throat> and if you also notice, we are following a very um, uniform naming construct. So everything is going to be all lowercase with underscores in between the words. So it's easy to read exactly what we're working with. So the executable statements here. Uh, first, we need to say, please enter the minute of observation. So we're going to get a printf because we can use this 
since we included standard input output dot h std io dot h the header file so we're going to do a new line with then please enter the minute of observation and then also include that it's supposed to be 0 through 60 so that the user knows what they're supposed to enter uh, then we have to let the user input so then we're going to use a scanf this is going to be separate from our printf because a printf only prints and a scanf only reads in so then we can take scanf and for that parameter we're writing in the minute of observation or time so we put in time but see that's not going to work because if it tries to write to time it's going to try to write to the value held within time what we want to do is write within the address where time is stored the number that we're scanning in so remember memory is physical uh, and so if you were to reference for this function just time if there's a zero in there it will go to the address in memory that is a zero if there was some other number say 37 in there it will go to address 37 and try to write that it will not work you can get memory faults you can get other weird stuff um, which we'll get into probably later on that's why we have to include the ampersand or address operator because this says take the address of time and write whatever we scan in into where that address is not um, not what what whatever the because it it's looking for the address because of the function itself just how it's set up uh, and so if you don't put that in there then it's going to be looking for whatever the value is that as the address but we don't want that we want to find this address the address that the identifier time represents so since this is a whole number we can use percent d uh, which is for whole numbers integers so that's going to then write in what the user enters for the time. So then let's real quick comment that so we can remember this uh, just because it's really good habit to have. So then um, prompt and read in user defined uh, time of observation. So then we can next see that we're going to need to print percentage obscured is 55 at time 10. So percentage obscured is whatever the percent is at time 10. So let's take the uh, print F again. So then let's see print percentage obscured of the eclipse and we'll want another new line now if you look here you see uh, there's two there's a full line in here in between these two prints uh, but if you think about it so you enter this the user hits enter enter then makes it go to the next line just like a, a word editor so if you hit enter again or new line then it will go to this next line so we only need to put one backslash n percent obscured is and then this is going to be a floating point number type so we'll do percent f although I believe a double is percent I but for the purposes of this lab we won't worry about that um, just always double check your data types we'll get into this actually later in the lab uh, or later in today's lecture so don't worry about it whatsoever uh, we will cover this today um, and then it says at time and then it's a whole number so percent D because that is the uh, standard and so percentage obscured is then going to be percent star obscured and then after that comes percent D for the time and so then we'll print the time so if you notice 
D's. I'll put this so it's a little bit easier to see. Percent F comes before percent D. Percent star obscured comes before time. It's left to right and it's red left to right. So we have one more thing we have to do. We have to calculate what the percentage of the stars obscured, correct? Because we have time, we read in time, we know what that is, but we still have to um, calculate what the percent obscured is. Now we're given this by this equation right here. So as a matter of fact, we can do percent star obscured is equal to, and then paste in that, T will become time and we should have then this first print statement. However then we have the next line but we'll get to that the current brightness at time 10 is expected to be we'll get to that here in just one second. If we go ahead we're gonna see one we'll go ahead and do the first test case let's see so it is going to run in the function main errors three three four two um Ah, oh, this is actually perfect. So, because we're dealing with integers here, it depends on your compiler whether this will mess up or not. There's something called typecasting. Because these are integers, and this is a double, and I'm pretty sure this will fix it. Getting to see a little bit of troubleshooting here live. Um, because this is a double, and this is an uh, these are the time is an integer and percent star obscured is a double. Uh, what happens is when it mixes them, it doesn't like that because it's trying to mix different data types and that gets very complicated. So let's try it again. Still not working. Uh, let's see. Percentage. Let's see, percent star obscured equals. Hmm. This is very interesting. Sixteen Aristray. This is actually perfect. Uh, I will go ahead and do a little bit of troubleshooting here. So stray three four two is the error code we're getting. Why? I'm not entirely sure. We can see here that it says right there, which means that it might have something to do with something above us, or it might be something right there. It appears that everything is declared correctly right there. Our printf is formatted correctly. Scanf is formatted correctly. Let's try searching for stray error in C. Stack Overflow is a wonderful resource. I would, whenever you're uh, searching for problems like this, this is a great site. If you see in the Google results, go to this. Ah, time. We cannot use time, it's a keyword. So this is one of those. Um, so if we just try changing that to T. Right 
there. Where am I missing? T T T. Time percent D. Three four two. Let's try doing a typecast again. Like I said, I'll just I'll explain what's what that means here in just a minute. It's not going to work, is it? Okay, well I will not worry about this for now. I don't want to waste everyone's time. I will get this worked out and post a solution to it later, figuring out why this is. It could be just the compiler and not actually a error with the syntax. Um, yeah, no, I've done all these problems. Uh, I did all these labs earlier this semester, actually, so... Uh, I don't recall having an issue, so I'm pretty sure that this had to, that this must be something to do with the uh, compiler. I suppose one other thing we can try real quick is just to make this a double instead, and then do percent %f, um, also double type scanf in C. So it's lf for long float. That could also be it. Because it's double precision, LF long float. Yes, not exactly sure what's going on here. We'll figure this out a little bit later. Um, uh, double precision is just more precise uh, ra rather than float. So doubles. I don't know how to exactly explain it, uh, but floats and double fl uh, float and a double can't exactly just because of how the uh, how it is in binary they can't exactly represent a number and so what they do is they approximate it as closely as they can and because a double has twice as much memory as a float why well, it's called a double because it's double precision or twice as precise, uh, then you don't have to worry as much about, you don't have to worry as much about having weird errors or slight, I guess, uh, unpredictability, because it will be more consistent, uh, just because it has twice as much memory to store than a floating point variable. So, uh, so let, let's real quick pull up Let's go to, where'd I put the, here we go. Let's go to lecture two. So I will post the lab one solution. I'll probably just make a video about that after I figure out exactly what was the issue with this. Um, I did get it working fine in JDoodle, but I'm not sure what's the issue uh, there. All different compilers have a few little I guess, inter interesting individual uh, things that you just have to be aware of and you get used to, and I have not used this one very much, but it is does seem to be just a better platform, so we will move to that. So data types. There are many data types, each specialized for a specific type of information to be stored. If you remember from the first lecture, um, information contained in a variable's memory is binary number, and the interpretation of this binary number is determined by the data type of that memory. So whenever we're looking at picking data types, we have all these different things to work with, right? Um, so the five main data types, integer, float, double, character, and void. Uh, the integer is going to be whole number, right? Float is floating point. Double is going to be a more precise 
uh, floating point value. Character is going to be for that ASCII table that we included in, let's see if I can pull it up real quick. In the first lecture, if you remember the, the ASCII standard table. Where is it? Here we go. Um, every single integer number, every single number has a character representation. And so for that, a character stores an integer and then because it's a character data type, interprets it then as a, as a character. So if you, so arrays we'll get into later, but essentially an array is a series of a single type of data types that all is under the same identifier. It's just a bunch of individual uh, numbers that are in a row. And so if you want to store, say, a sentence or a word, you just have multiple character va uh, variables in this special construct that, like I said, we'll get into that will then handle that very nicely. A void uh, does not contain a value, doesn't return a value. Um, it's just like in mathematics, there was a point uh, where the concept of zero came up with that was difficult for many people to grasp, but was very key to the language of mathematics. Void can be a little bit difficult to grasp, but is key to, uh, to programming languages. And just like zero represents nothing, void is even more so nothing. It doesn't have a it doesn't have a value. It doesn't have zero. It doesn't have anything. Uh, so if you wanted so if you have something where it just needs to execute, it doesn't need to return a variable, it doesn't need to do anything else, then you would use a void. So we'll get into example usages of that later on. So that would be like if you're printing uh, if you have a bunch of print statements you could create a function that's like print everything and then that would be the void data type because it doesn't have to return a value. So, um, if you if you want more information, I would recommend just about data types and everything. I would recommend uh, checking out the Wikipedia page here because it is very helpful. They have everything, just like there's long double, you know, all these different things. Uh, float, unsigned, signed and unsigned. I guess I should make a note. Signed variables are positive or negative. They have a sign to them. Unsigned are just always positive. And because they're always positive, uh, they don't have to worry about storing the range of negative to positive, And so they have, they can go twice as large by being like in this instance, an unsigned long, long int. It also has then the format specifier for whether you're uh, using scanf or, uh, or printf or what have you. Uh, so like I said, this is a great resource. It has some different, there's some extra information as well about like Boolean and stuff. Uh, Boolean, I suppose I should also touch on, you have to include a library to use Boolean. Boolean is also like everything else, just a number, but it's true or false. It's ones and zeros. And so it can be very useful for some things just to make them a little bit easier to comprehend, but it's very application specific and there's no real need to use it because again you can just use an integer and it accomplishes the exact same thing. So a uh, data type selection is really on uh, it's it's up to you it's based on selecting what you need uh, based on the the use of like how you're going to use the data stored in there. So just like in this lab here we knew that we knew that percentage was going to be a decimal, then for that we want to use a decimal point. Uh, just like time will always be a whole number, if we wanted to, it could become a decimal number as well, but that's up to the user, to the, uh, the programmer to decide, and there's no, especially with the, the uh, resolution of the data we're working with, there's no need to do anything more than a whole number. So just you know it really does come down to exactly what kind of data you need so use of variable and data types there are three uh, for for variables data types whether it be functions or functions or variables pretty much there's three things so there's the declaration initialization and manipulation 
So, or excuse me, let me let me rescind that. I thought this was a different um, section. Does not this is not applicable to functions, just to variables. So there's three main things, uh, three three main steps to to using variables, and then um, also then how the data type plays into each of those three steps. So there's the declaration of the variable, where the identifier is first determined, the initialization, which is the first time a value is stored in a variable, and manipulation of the variable, which is when you use it in a calculation. Excuse me. Um, you put it as a parameter in a function call, what have you. Uh, so the declaration and initialization are many times one and the same and actually collapse together to be one and the same. So to real quick, let me let me drag over let's get a new one. So if we put here, and we want this on the next line. Ah, I wonder if it has to do with the parameters being void on the other one. I'll test that later. So if you have int, uh, bunnies are, can't type, bunnies are cute this would be considered a declaration. But if you said bunnies are cute, this is both a declaration and then also an initialization because we're initializing the value of zero. Until you set that value to zero, whatever's in the memory that it picks for this identifier, if there's a leftover value stored in that memory from a different program, uh, from even a different user on the computer or something, it doesn't matter. Anything that's in that physical memory is then associated with the identifier whether you intend for that to be the case or not. So you have to set a value then in order to prevent that. So uh, when things should be initialized to zero, initialize them to zero. If they'll be calculated and assigned a value then before they are referenced, then that is the initialization. It's whenever it's the first time there's a value going into that. Manipulation is then just something like Let's create another one, int num of bunnies. So then let's say there are num of bunnies becomes, we'll say there are five bunnies, right? <coughs> <coughs> and then we'll say, we'll, we'll create another, um, integer that represents how cute they are. <clears throat> Bunny cuteness. And we'll initialize that to be it's intrinsically worth 10. So if the num bunnies, then we set this here, this is not an this would be num of bunnies initialization, because it's the first time a value stored there. And then we can do bunnies are cute equals itself times, that's what uh, times equals means, is uh, whatever the that variable is, excuse me, <coughs> whatever the variable that you're assigning is equal to itself times then, or excuse me, we don't need that for this, brain hiccup, is then equal to, to the num of bunnies times bunny cuteness. which then we can see here would be num of bunnies uh, times cuteness, 5 times 10, 50. So this here is a declaration and initialization, just a declaration, declaration and initialization, just an, an initialization, and then this is all manipulation. And I'll comment this just so it's a little bit clearer.
So, going on to the next one, data type conversion and typecasting. I want everyone to work through this problem real quick and then I'll throw in a live question for it. But there's two different types of data conversion. So if you have an integer that you'd like to all of a sudden be a floating type variable or you have a floating type that would you'd like to be an integer, you have to remember that when you're dealing with different variable types or with different data types with variables that it's not going to change what the it's not going to change the actual variables data type what you have to do then is have some way of converting that without changing the variable type or the the data type since once it's set it cannot be changed once it has been initialized once that memory has been dedicated it will not change and so what we use is is typecasting or also then um, either typecast uh, typecasting or coercion so uh, let's look at the definition type conversion or typecasting refers to changing an entity of one data type to another there are two types of conversion implicit and explicit the term for implicit type conversion is coercion explicit type co conversion in some specific way is known as casting explicit type conversion can also be achieved with separately defined conversion routines such as an overloaded object constructor don't worry about the uh, the last part so much focus mainly on implicit and explicit while coercion and casting are good terms to know I really want you to know the implicit and explicit uh, just because it's easy to remember the difference between the two and that's really gonna be I guess where the meat of this concept is in being able to differentiate the two and know how they're different and why they're different and because that's how you're gonna be able to figure out exactly how you're getting different outputs so we're gonna look at a really simple um, example here of int a equals 4, int b equals 5, int x, double y, all these. And so we're going to real quick, um, we'll, we're going to run this program here in just a second. But first, I want everyone to, I guess, write down, we'll give, I'll give you uh, 60 seconds timer for one minute. And we'll do two minutes. And then try to work through this on your own. And then we'll real quick run the code and see what the answers are. See if we're right. So pre predict the answers to question one, two, three, and four. And yes, we will cover examples of uh, using and avoiding keywords. I don't know, or I'm not sure if time is a keyword. Like I said, I'll figure out the uh, the solution and post it, post a video of it. Okay, so I'll give you guys about 20 more seconds. We'll stop at 30, uh, 90 seconds total. So um, let's look at an interesting here, thing here. So if x is equal to b over a, uh, b, 5 divided by 4 should be what? 1.25 or 5 fourths? And y is double, exact same thing, should be equal to 5 over 4. So if you then run this quickly, we're going to see something interesting. We're going to see that this program is, being is very annoying today. Y 
What is the matter? We're going to use jdoodle shortly. I will figure out exactly why this is being difficult and, like I said, make a video on it. So let's real quick try executing this. Goodness, what is the issue? Okay, I'm gonna have to explain this manually and figure out why this is an issue. I have not had issues with these compilers until today. Interesting. So anyhow, the first one is x. x equals b divided by a. So we have an integer is equal to an integer divided by an integer. So because these are all whole numbers, we can't break out of that construct. So there's a truncation of data. Truncation means like extra data is chopped off, just um, ignored essentially, not stored. And so what we have here is b divided by a, 5 divided by 4, is only going to return the whole number that b can go into a. So, or the a can go into b. And so, x for question 1 will be equal to 1. Only 1. Um, for y, y is a double. And because int b divided by int a is still an int divided by an int, that will still be just simply 1. Oh, I just remembered. I forgot to use percent %d. That might have been the issue. No, not double. Let's give this a... It should be lf percent %d. Is this, gonna, this won't work well. Nope. Interesting. Yeah, I will look up the stray error later. But if we have here then x is equal to or is equal to itself times y. So that's going to be 1 is equal to itself times 1. 1 is equal to itself times 1. So it, everything in these are going to be they're going to be 1. But there's an interesting thing you can change then. Because this is converting everything here into an integer or a whole number, just like b divided by a, while in mathematics that would be a fraction or a decimal, uh, it's converting it to an integer here. If you look at then explicit, so this is implicit or implied conversion, if you look at explicit, where it explicitly states what the conversion is, we get a more interesting um, return. So x equals double b over a. So if you notice, th these two examples are identical. The only difference is we put in parentheses the word double prior to this, prior to this. And we could change this even so that it then is b divided by double a. Does not matter. It is associative of right to left, so a is associative to the double command. And what that does is it then, just for this statement, converts a into a double. It does not change the actual variable itself. It just converts the value of a into a double so that then it can use that additional information, even though it's just zeros, use the addi additional information of having a floating var variable, a uh, floating decimal point variable type, to then be able to uh, give us, well, for x, since x is an integer, this will still equal 1. 
but then for y, and like I said, double can be associated with b or a, just has to be one of those, uh, one of the variables in the assignment expression. This will then be equal to 1.25. And like I said, I'll get some, uh, some example code working. I'll make a video about what the issue is with uh, these compilers. Uh, one, a little bit later today and I'll post that. I'll record a video and post that. And then x is equal to itself times y. So 1 is equal to itself times 1.25. So this would still be 1 because it is, this is an integer data type. But y is equal to itself times x. This will be 1.25 because this is even though this is an integer, this is a double, and so it will retain then double times integer uh, of being, but it'll, it'll retain that floating point. So um, you could also change this, however, to y equals int y times x, and this will only be one because it's, it's truncating that decimal point off of y, but only for this, this expression here. So that takes it from being 1.25 to only being 1, and then multiplies it times 1, so then y would equal 1. So just a few interesting things about data types and how they're converted, because this is something that's very important and has caused me personally a lot of issues uh, just over the years in VEX when I've been trying to troubleshoot why I'm not getting quite the, uh, the answer I was expecting. And so that has just been really, really helpful for uh, being able to understand exactly what's going on in your code, see where the issues are, and trace through the variables and see why you're getting weird values somewhere if you have a bug you just can't quite find. So I'm going to move as quickly as I can for the last 10 minutes. We have some ground to cover. Uh, there's going to be a couple of projects I want you guys to work on on your own. Not anything big, just activities of things to think about. So for the preprocessor directives and operatives, uh, the, there's just, I guess, um, some general constructs you need to keep in mind. So none of them should have a semicolon at the end of their respective lines, with the exception of the function definitions. Uh, this is a variance from most other expressions in the C language, meaning uh, so for, for constants, for for any sort of preprocessor -proce pre directives, whether that's defining a constant or including like we did in the other file, including that, there's not going to be a semicolon. However, for anything else here, whether you're declaring a variable or calling a function or what have you, those all do. The only time you don't then also would be for the function definition or for at the end of brackets make the code that like chunk this code all together so so keep in mind be careful of your semicolons because that can create issues just with your code so including in the library uh, including a library in your code then is going to be like I just mentioned the other time you're not going to use a semicolon and this is also preprocessor preprocessor directive because this all happens before uh, before it gets compiled this is one of the earliest steps of the compiler and so before any processing happens um, this is setting that up so before you're going to actually be you know assigning values to variables or what have you this is one of those first things that gets set up as it's compiling the code so defining the constant name, the value, an expression, you can have either a value or an expression that you're defining. So you could have let's real quick here. Let's say I want a constant pi, so we're going to do a hashtag define uh, pi constant. I'm not sure if pi is a I don't believe it's, I think it's reserved. So we can have 3.14159. Now the interesting thing about these constants, 
and this preprocessor directive is because it goes through and every time this is referenced in the code, as it's um, as it's uh, compiling, it replaces this number in there. So it's so if you have so you don't have to define a data type because what it essentially does is if you have uh, ignore all this I guess int circumference. So then we have circumference is equal to, um, and we'll add uh, int diameter is equal to diameter times pi constant. This will compile as if we had typed this instead. So that's why this is a preprocessor directive is because uh, before it actually processes the code, before it actually uh, compiles it, it's going to just literally substitute in uh, this value here for that. That's literally what the compiler does. So I hope that kind of explained it a little bit better for you. Do we have any other, let's see, wooden questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, I apologize if I misspoke. I believe I said question two. Or no, question two. Yes, it's a double. I'm getting question. When you say question two, I'm assuming you mean on example one. Example one, it would be one because although y is a double, a and b are both integers and an integer divided by an integer will equal an integer. Even if the data type that it's assigned to is a double because it's truncating that that data um, on example two however because it's typecasting one of those so it's an integer divided by a, a double or a double divided by an integer then it won't so it would be 1.25 uh, but I'm not sure dudes 99 whether you're referring to example one or two but that's kind of the answer to both so So that gives you the hashtag include and hashtag define. Uh, there's lots of libraries out there I suppose I should mention. Um, so for header files, if you're making your own library, so say you have an extra code file specifically for all of your autonomous functions, uh, so you would have, you know, red side one, red side two, red side three, red side four, autonomouses, blue side one, two, three, four. If you had all of those, then you could, then you could make your own header file and include that but you could also include math.h you could include a lot of other um, a lot of other libraries that are out there there are custom libraries there's all kinds of libraries because all a library is is just a head header file that has functions that you can use then in your code there's also something uh, for if define else if and end if uh, those all go together they're for logical um, logical statements I'm not going to get into that just because it is more complicated and the best thing you can do is just check out the information on Wikipedia. It's a great, great resource and has um, probably the best explanation of it and the uses for it of anything I've seen. So for math, programming in math uh, is interesting because it's essentially, math, programming there are languages, right? You're putting logical expressions, you're putting uh, an entire world into this alternate language that then the machine is able to, through an interpreter, understand and do something with. Mathematics is also, by definition, a language because it describes the world around us. If you're trying to convert a math formula then into, um, into programming, the only way to do that is for you to be the translator and to see this is a Riemann sum, this is, uh, you know, whatever it is, that this is somehow, that you are taking that expression and putting it into then the programming language so then the computer can understand it. So you have to be very careful also when you're doing that because uh, it can get very tricky to get the, uh, to convert that into something that is still true to what the mathematical expression represents but is understand uh, understood by the computer. So there's five, I suppose I should also contrast, there are math operators and then there's also the math.h library for ma uh, more advanced math functions. The operators are included 
in the language itself. This is a library of additional functions that is separate. Uh, and if you have to go at three, no worries. I might run a few minutes over, but as always, this stream will be available on the uh, YouTube channel after it's done. Please do also like, comment, subscribe so I can get more feedback and try to make these better. I do intend to go th back through all these lectures at some point after I've the entire course worked out and put together a coherent, uh, much quicker, easier to understand course that then uh, hopefully can be utilized by many teams for years to come. So uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Please do continue to tune in and subscribe, turn on notifications so that you're aware of when the streams are happening. And I would really, really appreciate that. So uh, if you have to go, it's fine, but I will uh, wrap up and you can catch the remainder of it later. So. So there's, as I said, math operators and math functions. To contrast, the two math operators, as I said, are included in the, uh, in the language. Uh, plus and minus are of lower priority for times divided and modulus. So to put that in perspective, if you did 3 plus 4 times 5 uh, plus 5, 3 plus 4 times 5 would break it into 3, and then put a parenthesis around 4 times 5, and then plus five. So three plus four times five, uh, 20, or 23 plus five would be 28, not three plus four times five, 12 times five, 60 plus five. No, it would not be 65, it would be uh, 28. So to put that, I'll, I'll even write that out here. So for, um, example just as then four times five plus five equals 28. So it's literally, it's just like, uh, you know, basic math that we learned in what, uh, you know, sixth grade or something. It's, it's just that basic precedence that you multiply before you add, you divide before you add. And if it's multiplied or if it's multiplied, divide left to right, then uh, pre precedence goes left to right. So If you want more information about that, do check this out. This is a good, um, it gives you a list of all the different precedents. This is a great reference. I'll probably add this to the course references. Math.h is, like I said, a library that includes many functions for the programmer, for you know us as programmers to use. So we don't have to write the functions ourselves. So that would be things like power, square root, ceiling, where a number, if it's a decimal like 3.4, ceiling would even though 3.4 is less than you know half, it will still round up. It always rounds up. Floor always rounds down. So 3.4 ceiling of 3.4 would be four. Floor of 3.4 would be three. Floor of 3.99999 would be three. There's lots of math functions. Trig everything that you could ever need. Uh, so do check this more complete or very complete list out of all of them like i said there's so many and there's even functions for dealing with complex numbers you know it's literally for everything you could want to use um, there's probably a math function already for it so uh, whether it be translating a math problem into a programming language or breaking down a coding assignment into all of its counterpoints the counterparts for functional programming problem analysis is extremely important. Uh, so I want everyone, this will be assigned reading for this week, to read this, it's very, very, very short, very doable, on uh, software development process and kind of how you break problems down, analyze them, and then translate them into a coding project. Um, and so after looking at not just coding, but a few different ones, there I saw for under problem analysis, I guess a kind of general process that you can follow where you identify the requirements, specify the requirements, relate the requirements, 
uh, integrate and assemble the process, refine the process, then document it, implement it, and then maintain it. So what we're going to do is example activity one in class, and then I want everyone to think individually. I might throw out a, uh, I'll probably throw out an assignment so that you can submit it if you write it up. But for how do you write an engineering notebook? So example activity one, let's do this now. So how does someone make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? So let's identify the requirements of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So for, I'll just copy and paste this. I will restart numbering. So identify the requirements. What are the requirements of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Well, we're going to need uh, peanut butter, jelly, bread, and a means to assemble it, right? So we're going to also need a knife, maybe a spoon. Uh, but let's let's try to keep this simple. Probably a knife, uh, table knife. We want it to also probably be on a plate. Let's say it's a paper plate. So presentation. So. In order to specify these requirements now, we've, we've identified all the things we need for peanut butter. So under peanut butter, we're going to then just take all of these, I'll copy paste. Let's specify this. For peanut butter, we're going to need peanuts, we're going to need oil, salt, everything that it takes to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So uh, I, I guess think about that a little bit more. So I think all we would need is peanuts, oil, salt. For jelly, we'll need fruit, uh, probably depending on whether you're healthy or not, corn syrup. Uh, we'll need manufacturing facility for that, so a kitchen. For the bread, we'll need uh, all the ingredients, an oven, We'll need a baker, which I suppose we need a, a cook for all this, so I guess we'll just ignore that for now. Uh, under a table knife, we'll need wood for the handle, we'll need metal, we'll need then a uh, means to manufacture, so we'll need, uh, let's say, Smith Shop. Or metal, metal smith shop. Paper plate, we'll need raw materials of trees, or I guess raw wood. Everything, all the infrastructure to make paper, like a strainer, all that sort of stuff. I'm trying to move very quickly through this because this is very... Uh, conceptual. It's just trying to prove a point. So then you have to relate these requirements. So in order in order to have peanut butter and jelly and bread, knife, paper plate, and you know spread the peanut butter and jelly on the bread and everything, what we're gonna have to do is first make the peanut butter, then make the jelly, make the bread, then spread the peanut butter and jelly on the bread, uh, then we're going to have our paper plate that we'll put it on so we have to relate the order then that it's going to have have to happen so we can say it doesn't matter what order that we make the peanut butter jelly and bread but we have to just make peanut uh, uh make p b and j assemble p b and j serve p b and j sandwich so now that we have related how we're going to do this and everything we have to actually come up with the process so to make the PB&J 
the peanut butter and jelly and bread. I suppose I should also put and bread. We have to come up with the processes for making peanut butter, the processes for making jelly, and the processes then for making the bread. How we're going to do each of those. We're going to do the refinement process of, you know, was there too much peanut butter? Was there not enough peanut butter? Was there too much jelly? Was there not enough jelly? Was the bread burned? Could the bread, you know, be a little bit saltier? Uh, the documentation process then is documenting exactly this is what we did. This is how we came up with it. This is our, you know, testing idea, our testing cycle of why we thought there was too much uh, peanut butter, why there was, you know, not enough jelly. And then the implementation process of then being able to relate these processes actually so that anyone can view whether it be programming language or an engineering notebook or what have you anything for which we're creating this process that the end user is able to then view documentation and use it for the maintenance then it's just you know what do we have to do we have to clean the knife we have to do everything in between being able to use uh, we have to clean the knife, we have to, you know, make another paper plate, everything that we have to do in between each process, iteration, uh, to be able to keep it going. So, you know, it's very easy to see how this applies to programming, uh, where instead of talking about, you know, PB and J, it would be, uh, you know, how we're going to calculate the brightness of the star, how we're going to calculate the visibility uh, to refer to lab one, how those relate together, and then how we're going to be able to manipulate you know the exact requirements we're going to have to have for each of those like the data type and everything relating how those are going to interact together the integration and assembly process of how the entire project is going to come together what we're going to do to refine it documenting what exactly we did implementing it and then just maintaining um, so that you know what if we want to change it so then all of a sudden instead of having uh, like in the lab where it just executes once, what if we want to be able to do three at a time, three time predictions at a time? What if we want to be able to do an infinite number? What if we want to just do all of them and print it out? And so the maintenance process is kind of what are we going to do to keep this up and uh, make it still usable? So for in robotics, that would be, you know, how are we going to manage all of our autonomous routines? How are we going to manage as our strategy evolves, like there's so many applications. So going back, just look over real quick for what the requirements identified, specified, and related, and then the processes being integrated and assembled, refined, documented, implemented, and then maintained. Everything that it takes to do those eight steps, because it's a pretty um, pretty good outline of that process. So sorry today ran over a little bit and for the glitches along the way. Uh, today's been a little bit rough just with trying out the new encoding software which hopefully being able to see me has been a little bit I guess easier to put a name to a voice, put a face to a voice at least, and also made it a little bit more interesting to watch. So uh, see you all later. Please, com uh, please comment any feedback you might have subscribe and I will see you all for the next lecture. Please email me eatsleeprobotics at gmail.com if you have any questions at all. I'm very happy to answer those. Finally, I have a laptop too, so I'm able to kind of stay on th top of things much more easily than I was able to before and I'll do my best to make sure that we get the lab solution and everything all set up before our next lab and that then uh, we'll We'll have all the examples all ready for you. So thank you, and I will see you all later. Bye.